Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is a plant-based registered dietitian who was introduced to me by a previous guest, Dr. Will B., and she has a brand new book that has been crushing it on the bestseller list. I know she's number one in new releases right now on Amazon and abdominal disorders. And she specializes in gut health, actually. We're going to learn a little bit more about her story today, but she's also going to do a recipe from the book, a chickpea umami burger. Yum. Please welcome to the show, registered dietitian, Desiree Nielsen. Nice to meet you. So nice to meet you too, Chef AJ. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you. Well, congratulations. Your book is doing really well. I, I love it when a plant-based book is in the, even in the top hundred, but to be number one, that is fantastic. I know, you know, it excites like as a dietitian, but also as a plant-based eater myself, like nothing thrills me more. It's so exciting to have so many books in this space doing well. So I cannot wait to hear your story. And I'd like to know what came first, you being plant-based or you being a dietitian? This is just my little oven heating up. So I was actually vegetarian first. So like my first foray into even thinking about changing my diet or thinking about the way that I eat in a conscious way, uh, I became vegetarian as a teenager. So, and I was an ethical vegetarian. I really, I, I learned about, you know, how meat is brought into our food system, how it arrives on our plates. And I was like, you know, this is not for me anymore. Um, so I spent years doing that and went into school to become a dietitian already as a vegetarian. And then it wasn't until like, my mid thirties, when I started learning far more about our food system, you know, the, the foods that I thought were, you know, relatively harmless, like dairy and eggs. And I understood more about how we actually produce them. And I was like, you know what, all the reasons why I went vegetarian are the reasons that I need to be hundred percent plant-based. Nice. That's fantastic. So when did you decide to become a registered dietitian? Yeah. So, you know, I think that I can probably claim you know, credit for vegetarianism bringing me towards it because I was so lucky. I had a really beautiful upbringing as far as food was concerned. So I'm first gen Canadian. Um, my family immigrated from Europe. My mother's side of the family is Portuguese. And, you know, in our house, if you've walked through the door, you must be hungry. The first thing you will be offered is food, like even before your butt hits the seat. It's like, what can I feed you? And my grandmother had these incredible gardens and I grew up at her apron springs, like learning how to cook, like all of these different foods. And we never really talked about food in terms of like healthy or unhealthy. We ate like caldo verde, which is a traditional Portuguese greens and potato soup, like very humble, very simple, alongside maybe eating a burger the next day. And so I had this really rich culture of food and I never really thought about it until then. And when I first went vegetarian, I was like, oh, like we can choose to change how we eat. Maybe these choices can impact the planet or maybe they can impact our health. Like it never, ever occurred to me, but it sparked this curiosity. And I started running to the bookstore and started to read about nutrition, learn about health. And at that point, I didn't even know what a dietitian was. I actually became really inspired because this was as sort of the birth of like integrative medicine and, you know, my ultimate inspiration at that point as a teenager was Dr. Andrew Weil, who talked about, you know, how taking vitamin C could help promote healing in the body or how vegetables were so critical to health. And I was like, wow, this is what I want to do. I want to show people how to live their life to make them feel really good and help them heal. And I thought it was a doctor uh, who was the only professional that could do that. And so when I went to college, I started doing nutrition because I thought, well, you know, in medical school, there's not a ton of education around uh, nutrition. So I'll go get a nutrition background because that really, really drives me. I'm really passionate about that and then try and get into med school. But of course, the faculty that taught you nutrition is also the faculty where they teach you how to be a dietitian. And I was like, what's this dietitian stuff that I've never heard of? And once I learned a little bit more, I realized so much of what I thought that I would do as a doctor, I could actually do as a dietitian. And I was like, you know what? I think this is it for me. That's fantastic. But you have a, an extra specialty, don't you, in, in GI health? 
Yeah. So, you know, it is the focus of my practice is really has always been three things. So plant based diets, of course. Uh, and then my first interest very much back to those Dr. Andrew Wild days was inflammation. And so it was that inflammation along with my first job, like real job as a dietitian, where everyone was asking me about gut health that then sparked the interest. So when I was a when I first became a dietitian, I wasn't thinking too much about gut health, but immediately, like within six months of beginning as an actual real dietitian, I was like, wow, something's going on with people's guts. There's not a lot of help out there apparently for them or information for them. So I'm going to dive in to the fray. I'm going to find out what research there is. I can find out what is actually going on with people's guts and how I can use nutrition. And this was back, I mean, this was back in the day because this was over a decade ago like a lot of this stuff was even a little bit controversial. You know, uh, for folks with irritable bowel syndrome, they may have heard of the low FODMAP diet, for example, which now is like as close to gold standard for supporting symptoms in IBS as like anything. Back then, low FODMAP was considered like controversial, you know? And so here I was diving into low FODMAP over a decade ago, because I was like, we don't have any other tools to support these folks and they're really suffering. So that is where my love affair with the gut started. And then it moved from professional to personal for me because after the birth of my first child, my gut went awry, just absolutely awry. And I was like, okay, let's test for celiac disease. Like going back to my doctor again and again, there must be something going on. And everything was clear and we're like, oh, Okay, IBS. And so then it became personal and that really supercharged my interest in this area. I would love to talk more about IBS, but one thing I want to ask you before I forget is in dietitian school or dietetic school, whatever you call it, did you learn anything about the plant-based diet at all? Particularly because of, you know, my generation of dietitian, it was very little, you know, and I have to admit that going into dietetics, both as someone who was interested in integrative medicine, but also as a vegetarian, I was like, I might be a little fringe here. Like, I don't know how this will be, you know, perceived or accepted. And, you know, there was still a lot of dietitians, gosh, maybe even five years ago, a lot of dietitians pointing to plant-based diets as being potentially restrictive. And, you know, so it's so important for me that people understand the abundance and the joy and the like incredible power in plant-based eating because there's no restriction. Anything you could possibly want to make, any of your favorite foods can be made completely plant-based. They can be flavorful. They can be enjoyable. And like, this is a zero deprivation way of living. Absolutely. You mentioned you got IBS after the birth of your child. Is there ever a connection with that? Is that something pregnant women should worry about? You know, it's interesting because I haven't seen a lot of research specifically linking pregnancy to IBS, but there's a lot of things that happen in pregnancy. Like we know that there's increased inflammation in the body, which is a natural thing, you know, so this is not something to generally get too concerned about, um, but there is increased inflammation in the body. There is also microbiome changes noted in pregnancy. And so I really think it's, you know, depending on the individual, for me, for example, my child was early. And so typically in pregnancy around 37 weeks, we get a screening for something called group B strep. It's a type of bacteria that can be harmful for the baby. My baby decided to come early, very impatiently, and I wasn't able to take that test. I hadn't taken that test. So when I was delivering, I had to be on antibiotics. So I was on IV antibiotics during the delivery. And then of course, with my first child, those heady days, you're not sleeping. Gosh, I was not cooking. I'm pretty sure the only way we ate was takeout for months and months and months. And then I was stressed out and tired. And I think it was that perfect storm of everything, the stress, because we know there's that deep gut brain connection. And particularly for me with my IBS, I know the primary driver is not my diet. So I think at that point, it was the changes in pregnancy, the stress, the lack of sleep, and then the change in diet that just all contributed to a lovely little IBS storm. <laughs> <laughs> so I assume you had a plant-based pregnancy. I did. Yeah. Two plant-based pregnancies, healthy, 
wonderful full-size children. Like I'm here to tell you that plant-based can absolutely nourish you and your children when you're pregnant. Um, and with no changes, you just take your prenatals like everybody else does. You take your omega-3 like everybody else does. And then you just eat all your good plant foods. And you can even raise children this way. You totally can. Absolutely. I think, you know, the more, and one of the reasons why I love to be so vocal about this is because the more health professionals that truly understand the plant-based diet, and I think this is where this, this concern around plant-based pregnancies or raising plant-based kids come from simply because people don't understand. Because if you don't cook this way yourself, you have no idea where are you getting your iron? Where are you getting your protein? Where are the healthy fats coming from? How do you turn the meals that you know into plant-based meals that are just as nutritious, if not honestly, more nutritious? And so I think it's really important for health professionals to engage with plant-based cooking, even if they're not fully plant-based themselves, because how can you counsel appropriately on how to craft a healthy plant-based diet if you don't know these foods, if you don't know these ways of cooking? Because I'm pretty sure Mike, if you saw my kids, you would have no qualms about how incredibly healthy they are. They are fast, they are smart, they are tall, all of the things. That is fantastic. Deborah, who's watching live, says, I really enjoyed her show, The Urban Vegetarian. I wish it was still on. Maybe talk about what that is. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, so I had a one season wonder cooking show. And it's so interesting because when I mentioned I went fully plant-based in my 30s, I was almost nearly there. I was like 95% plant-based. And then I got offered the opportunity to do this cooking show. It was vegetarian and vegan. So it was about 50% vegetarian recipes, 50% vegan. I was like, you know what? How cool is this that on national TV in Canada, they're going to put like a vegetarian show. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. And it was fun and terrifying because honestly, I was like a deer in headlights. I do lots of local media segments but to sit there in a studio and like, this is it, this is your show, you're running, you know, you're keeping everyone engaged, you're telling those stories. I was honestly a little terrified, but I was really proud of the food that we shared. And one of the things that I really loved about that show is that it was flavor first. It was about showing people how delicious vegetarian and vegan eating was. And yeah, it was just, it was a really great opportunity. And I feel so grateful that we were able to sort of like spread the message of, hey, like you can make a great meal without putting meat on your plate. That is fantastic. Uh, Amy says, ooh, another cookbook. Love those cookbooks. Hey, can you, I, we didn't even ask you to show the book. I have the, 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 not the hard copy of the book, you know, the, the Kindle version. Yeah. So please show the book. You can hold it up for people. Yeah, so this is good for your gut. It is a full length cookbook. There are over 90 completely plant-based recipes and they're delicious for everyone. If all you want is just some great, not too difficult plant-based food, this book is for you. But should you be curious about gut health or be trying to like shift something in your gut health, the recipes are actually divided into three different kinds. We have the protect recipes. Protect recipes are about maintaining or generally improving your gut health. So they are high in fiber. They are high in fermentable carbohydrates like the FODMAPs and they're high in plant diversity. So these are the ones that are for everyone for any time. Then we have the heal recipes. Heal recipes are a little bit different. They're low FODMAP. And it was really important to me to make a third of the book low FODMAP. And there's full directions and directives on what low FODMAP is and how you go about it in the book as well in the front. But one of the things we find in practice being plant-based is that clients will come into practice saying, well, my doc or my naturopath or a nutritionist said, I can't be plant-based anymore because I have IBS, which could not be further from the truth. Again, it's because people don't understand the diet. And if you go online, there are not a lot of delicious plant-based low FODMAP recipes. It's really hard to find. It really when, is. Cause I, I mean, how do you do anything without onion? It's so hard. I had to set aside my very deep love of garlic and onions. Um, I won't lie. I became obsessed with green onion tops <gasps> because those are low FODMAP. So that's the end of the scallion, right? Yes, exactly. And only the dark green, the, the light green and the white high in FODMAPs, but the dark green of the green onion or the scallion, perfect. So there's a lot of that in this book for sure. And then the third category of recipes is soothe. 
Soothe are for the people with really fussy guts. You know, I'm thinking someone with new celiac disease or someone with a bit of a flare up of Crohn's disease or even IBS who think to themselves, plant foods are too hard to digest. Like I can't tolerate them right now. So soothe are either very softly cooked vegetables, vegetables that are a little bit lower in fiber or blending at vegetables, legumes. For example, if you're like, oh, I can't tolerate chickpeas right now. What you can tolerate is a couple of tablespoons of a white bean dip or a hummus because we can build up our tolerance. Even the most challenged guts can build up tolerance. And so we use the soothe recipes to help us do it. That is fantastic. I have a question from a live viewer named ah. Lydia, and she wanted to know if you would share your thoughts on PPI medication for acid reflux. Good. So as a dietitian, the first thing I will say is that the decision to take any medication is 100% with you and your physician because they know you best and that is their role. Um, from my perspective in gut health, one of the things that I notice often is that we will have clients who are on PPI medications for five years, for 10 years, and their reflux is still so bad. And so for me as a practitioner, I ask myself, okay, so we're taking this medication to improve a symptom. The symptom has not improved. Perhaps gut health has gotten worse recently as well. So I question the, the usefulness and whether or not there's a path working with the physician to take lifestyle measures and potentially wean yourself off that medication. So if that is something that our clients are interested in, if that's a possibility, we absolutely will support folks in doing it. And you know, particularly when it comes to reflux, there's a couple of things to note. We don't have a ton of dietary science to guide us in reflux, but we do know a couple of interesting things that I can share here. The first is that Largely plant-based diets, particularly Mediterranean diets standing in as a proxy for plant-based diets, seem to bear some improvement in reflux symptoms. And as a dietitian, it's one of the most powerful messages that I can share is pattern over plate. Oftentimes in nutrition, we think of one food for one purpose. So if I eat this, it will do this. Or if I avoid this, it will help me fix this it often doesn't work that way. Instead, it is the overall pattern of how we eat uh, over days and weeks and months that actually drive our health. And I like that because it gives us a little bit of like wiggle room, you know, <laughs> like every single thing we eat doesn't need to be quote unquote perfect if the vast majority of what we're doing is eating high fiber whole plant foods. A little bit of an exception to that with respect to reflex though, which is super fun, is that there is some interesting research on the use of psyllium fiber in reflux. The reason for this is that if the gut is moving slowly, in particular, the stomach is emptying slowly, that allows pressure to build up and potentially with the little trap door at the top of your stomach that's supposed to keep the acid in, it can get a bit floppier or saggier and let that acid come back up the esophagus. We do have some evidence to show that taking psyllium husk may help decrease symptoms of reflux. Uh, and the dosages, there was one study, it was very, very small. It was only 30 people and they had a very, very low baseline intake of fiber, which most of us in North America eat very little fiber. So most of us would be in the same boat. What they gave was 15 grams of psyllium fiber a day broken up into three periods so like three times a day five grams each this provided 12 and a half grams of soluble fiber what they found in this very very small trial it's not a perfect trial but 18 out of the 30 participants eliminated their reflux symptoms in 10 days so it's just fiber. You know, if it was a supplement, I might be like, I don't know, we need way more research. But since it's just fiber, we know soluble fiber is so good for us anyways. It's helpful to lower blood cholesterol, great at regulating digestion. 
it's worth a shot. It's worth talking to your doc and being like, I want to try this psyllium thing and see how it works. Nice. Why does it seem that gut issues seem like for so many people so hard to fix? Because they are multifactorial. So, you know, even for the heart, you know, when we talk about like heart disease and cholesterol, it's fairly straightforward for most people. Like if you eat your plants, get that fiber in, decrease your intake of saturated fats, things tend to improve relatively universally. The gut is different. I wish as a dietitian, I could say that nutrition was a hundred percent of it, but it's not. It's a big, big foundation, but the gut has a lot of nerves in it, which means the impact of your nervous system, stress has a huge role to play. And so many of us today, like we're like, oh, I'm not stressed, but we are working 60 hours a week, two jobs, you know, we have kids. We're so good and used to dealing with stress that we think we're not stressed. And we can fool like our thinking brain, but we cannot fool like our more primitive nervous system <laughs> if you're stressed it impacts digestive function. The other thing that really impacts it is um, how we move our body as well. The gut is a muscle, movement begets movement. We spend the vast majority of our days seated and not moving. Uh, even a great example is bloating. Bloating is a huge issue for folks. And when you sit all day, you are physically compressing the abdomen. And if you're wearing a really tight waistband, you're actually cutting off the flow of your gut. And sometimes, you know, we instantly think, oh, it must be something I ate. Let's not eat chickpeas because they're making me too bloated. If you simply bought a bigger pair of pants or like wore like something loose without a waistband, your bloating might go away. Nice. Uh, Shelly says that she has your book and she loves it. And Jan wanted to know if your recipes are oil free. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for supporting the book. I'm so glad you love it. The book is not oil free. I do use primarily olive oil and avocado oil. It's so easy to, I would say at least 75% of the recipes would be almost effortless to transition to oil free. A great example is the one that we're going to make a little bit later. I literally swapped oil for extra water. No big deal. Nice. Let's see. One of the things that, that I remember from your book is you said uh, the modern gut needs a modern solution. What do you mean by that, Desiree? I mean, it needs a holistic solution. And, you know, in sort of healthcare, medicine, nutrition, we are often taught things. And even in science, like the reason why science works is because it's very reductive. We, we try and control and push away all of the complexity so we get a clear answer. If this, then that. The challenge with that and of thinking of the body only in systems like the cardiovascular system, the digestive system, the nervous system, is that it gives us the, uh, the idea or perception that all of this stuff isn't connected. And so when we talk about modern guts, like I said, nutrition is critical. Modern food supplies are very high in sugar, salt and fat and very low in fiber. We need to address that because it's a driving factor in our, not just our gut function and movement, but in changing the microbiome. The modern microbiome doesn't look like it used to. And there's interesting science to show actually that there are mass extinctions in the modern microbiome that we are passing on to our children because these bacteria that require a ton of roughage like our, the ancient version of ourselves ate like a hundred grams of fiber a day. Now, I don't recommend that in the modern gut. That's a lot, but we can certainly do way better than we are now. And then the other piece of that is understanding how much our always on high stress, high productivity, low sleep environment is affecting our growth and repair functions in our body. So when we look at gut health, we, it has to be everything. Maybe not all at once, because that would be overwhelming, but we have to think, okay, where's the nutrition? Where's the movement? How am I building wind down routines in the evening so that I can facilitate a healthy sleep? 
what am I doing to lighten my load or even just put my phone away for three hours a day so that my nervous system can stop feeling so activated all of the time. Nice. One of the things you talked about in your book, which I appreciated is banishing the bloat, because I think at least some people I hear from, that's like one of the number one symptoms that uh, makes it harder for people adopting a plant-based diet. It's true. And it's, you know, and I think it's one of the reasons why people who are plant curious might be a bit wary and it might be holding them back because maybe whenever they eat chili, for example, they get super gassy or bloated. And so there's a couple of things to note here. The first and most important is that your gut is a muscle. And so you have to train for that plant life the same way you train your legs for a marathon. Like no one is gonna go from the couch to running a marathon in a week and then blame the running, right? We know that running is healthy for us, but we have to put in the work. It's exactly the same thing with plant foods. What makes them quote unquote hard to digest is the very same thing that makes them so beneficial. So we need to go slow. We need to take our time. If we're adopting a plant-based diet, let's start with the lower fiber plants. Let's eat, drink a lot of smoothies because that blender is gonna help facilitate digestion and make absorption a lot easier. Let's take our time. And then the other factor is, you know what, toots happen. Like I'm here to say as a dietitian, we pathologize gas and bloating. It's normal to get bloated every once in a while, not to be bloated and painful every day. Absolutely not go see your doctor, but every once in a while, it is a little bit normal to get bloated and it's a hundred percent normal to pass gas every single day. That means a you're eating how lucky B you have a functioning GI tract and C, you have microbes in that GI tract that are fermenting and doing all their good work that helps improve gut health, support the immune system, and support the nervous system. Great. Thanks. Uh, Elizabeth wanted to know, did you say you took omega-3 when you were pregnant? Yes. She wanted to know if you're still taking them now. Oh, good question. So yes, many, many people do not know. We all know about prenatals. Many people don't know that it's really important to take 200 to 300 milligrams of DHA easily found in an algae based oil with your pregnant in your pregnancy to help support the nervous system of your growing child. Um, Now I have to say I'm a little bit here or there. (laughs) So always I eat omega three rich seeds. That's part of something I call my daily three. So every day I'm eating some sort of ground flax, chia, or hemp to get omega-3 ALA because that is actually the omega-3 fatty acid that's deemed essential. That's the one that we have to get no matter what. DHA and EPA, there's a little bit of back and forth in the literature. If it's in the budget to get an algal DHA, doesn't hurt to take it, might be a great idea absolutely take it. So I would say that I'd probably take it half the year and like, I'll run out and then like not take it for a while and then buy some more. Nice. Nice. So with the recipes in the book, there was one that the the beet ravioli, like that just blew my mind. I, you know, I used to love those fancy raw food restaurants, which we don't have as many of anymore in Vancouver. I think it was a trend that's passed a little bit. And so I wanted to make something inspired by that era And, you know, the marinated beets are just, they're so lush and flavorful. And then the macadamia ricotta just feels so decadent, but the whole thing is incredibly nutrient dense. Like it's just, it's perfect. Do you make these recipes for your family? The beautiful recipes in the book with beautiful photography, I might add. I do. Thank you. Um, I have an incredible photography team because if there's one thing I can't do, it's take a nice photo to save my life. So I let the professionals do that, but I do everything else. And I do, this is how we eat. And I think, you know, my kids are like anyone else's kids. Uh, My youngest will eat sprouted grain bread, like no problem, where some people's kids are like, won't. Um, But sometimes she's like, she like doesn't like kale, right? She's not into kale. Um, So I serve it. I very much believe that we train our kids to eat the way that the adults eat. So the food is served with some accommodations to them, of course, 
you know, like I leave the kale off my daughter's plate because she's going to get the whole grain pasta. She's going to get some white beans and she loves those things. Uh, so yeah, this is how we eat. Do your kids have favorite recipes in the book? The one that really I want to make is the sweet potato broccoli croquette. That looks so good. Okay. They love, they absolutely love those croquettes, which are so fun. Um, it, Portuguese folks love a croquette. Like we just love like a breaded potato -y thing. And so that was very much my nod to my culture in that one. Um, but they love the burgers. Of course, burgers are such a hit with the kids and then the desserts. My kids go through enormous amounts of the peanut ginger macaroons. They just, they pop them like candy, which could not make me happier because they're so high in fiber. <laughs> Where did you get your culinary training? Um, right here at home. So I am, you know, it started with my grandma, but I am 100% an at-home cook, self-taught by buying cookbooks, going on the internet, making other people's recipes. And just, I mean, luckily I'm old enough that I've just had a really, you know, 20 years of that experience doing that. Because honestly, when I was 22, like a big day was like, you know, steaming up some broccoli and putting it on pasta and calling it a day. Yeah. That's funny. You know, one of the things I remember reading in your book that I appreciated when you were talking about bloating was meal spacing, because I know so many people that eat really healthy foods, like like an A plus diet, but they literally just eat all day. Like they 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 never take a break. Yeah. You know, and for some people and, and this is what I find so amazing about the diversity of bodies. We all have different ways of eating that make us feel really good. And so some people just thrive eating like little bits all day, every day. Like they just love that. I know for me, particularly after getting IBS, like, and I'm over 40, like that doesn't fly for me anymore. Like if I just eat bits, 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 same thing, everything starts to feel really sluggish. I probably get a little bloated. And so we do use meal spacing or time restricted eating in our practice for folks specifically who have a really sluggish digestion extreme bloating or constipation. And the reason for this is that, I mean, the body is amazing. We have this self-cleaning cycle called the migrating motor complex. And these are these rhythmic waves that are dictated by your nervous system that just help pass things through at regular intervals. And, you know, so we sort of use that physiology to help with motility. And so the hack for us if other sort of things haven't worked in practice, we suggest this, uh, that you eat a large enough and complex enough meal, making sure you're getting your fiber, your protein, your healthy fats, so you can feel full and satisfied and try and leave four hours in between meals. And when you do this, when you have digested and absorbed all that you're going to absorb, a little bit after that occurs, there's a third phase wave of these MMC waves. It's really strong. It starts in the stomach and sweeps the small intestine clear. It gets all that fiber down. It sweeps excess bacteria down. And actually, if you've ever had that sort of rumbling, gurgling in your stomach, that's part of the MMC. That's that third phase feeling. And so if you can allow that space, it just helps to sweep things clear. And for some people, but not all, it can really help to encourage movement to decrease constipation and decreased bloating. But everybody is different. Nice. Amy said she just ordered the book and she's excited to try the recipes. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see what you make. There's, I... You know, because I'm home taught and because I'm just I'm just like a regular cook who wants to eat different things, delicious things. There's like a wide variety of recipes in there that I'm really proud of, you know, some that are just like I need to get something tasty on the table quick for my kids. Others that it's the weekend and you're like, oh, I want my guests to like enjoy something a little bit special. There are sweets in there because I absolutely believe that a healthy life can include dessert. So. Yeah, I'm excited for everyone to experience them. Nice. Do you know any of the other plant-based registered dietitians that live in Canada, like Brenda Davis or Vasanto Molina? The first time I met Brenda Davis, I was shaking as if I was like meeting a rock star. So I was very new to uh, practice and happened to be uh, where she lived at the time. And yes, I know Vasanto very well. I know Brenda and there's some incredible 
new plant-based dietitians coming up in Canada, like Lauren McNeil as well. Um, yeah, I love to see, as a dietitian, I just love to see how many incredible new plant-based dietitians are out there because the more that we're out there, the more support that folks have for exploring this lifestyle so that they can feel successful and well and like really love it. Nice. Do you work with people? So I started a practice over a decade ago and because I've been writing books, I don't see any new clients myself one-on-one, -on -one, but I have this amazing dietitian in my practice. She's been with me for five years. She's also plant-based. She's just a whiz. Nice. Uh, there's a question. How is this book different from your previous books? Ooh, this is incredible. So my last book was called Eat More Plants, of course. Um, and the format of the book is the same in that the first section is the information. I really want to give you the why, the how, understanding nutrients and physiology, uh, and then you have the full length cookbook. So whereas Eat More Plants was focused on chronic inflammation and just introducing the concept of plant-based eating, like what's it about? What nutrients do you need? What foods do you eat? Good for your gut focuses a hundred pages in the front section, all about the gut. And I start at the very beginning. We talk about gut physiology, the fact that your gut is like 30 feet long, for example. We talk about how it works, how it's supposed to work, all the little things that can crop up like gas, bloating, constipation, what's normal, what's not. And then we dive into some more technical stuff because if someone has IBS, I'm gonna lead you through what it is, what the research says and how to do low FODMAP. So I really envision this as a book that people can come back to again and again. Like even if you're just gut curious and like, why is gut health so important? You're gonna learn now about why the gut is so important, how it's connected to the immune system, how it's connected to the nervous system. But if you have something to, to try and fix or heal, you can come back to the book and be like, okay, so I just got diagnosed with IBS. I'm gonna go back to the book, remind myself what IBS is and how lifestyle can approach it. Nice. Question about picky kids from Melissa. How do we help them, picky eaters that are children? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I I will answer you both as a dietitian and as a mom of what we call a more selective eater. My oldest eats everything. Uh, my youngest, not so much. So there are a lot of challenges, and I know the frustration because parents just want the best for their kids. We just want them to be so nourished and so healthy. And when we see kids rejecting foods or not eating what we think is enough, it can be really triggering for us because adults, we often have our own food issues too and our ideas around food. And it can be easy to pass those on to the kids. So I am absolutely not an expert in child feeding, but I will share what I've learned um, from my career, from raising kids, and also from some incredible colleagues uh, who do focus on this stuff. One of the first things is, is to not push food on kids. So the gold standard advice is to sit down to dinner, ensure that there is at least one food that every person likes. So say you're making a complex meal, but you know that your child doesn't like a lot of it, but they love tofu. So maybe they don't like the pasta you're making or the sauce you're making, but you know they love tofu. There has to be at least one food on the plate that your ch child will appreciate and eat. Then you place that food on the table and your job is done. It is the role of the parents to decide what is served and when it is served. It is the child's role, which comes back to, you know, the guru of child feeding, Ellen Satter, who's also a dietitian. The child's role is to decide if they eat. That's a big one. If they eat, if they eat, what they eat and how much they eat. And I wish I could say that I'm perfect at this with my own kids. I am not. I, I totally fall prey to the, we'll just have one bite. Just have one more bite. I do that to my kids. So I'm going to be real with you. <laughs> but the ideal is not to do that. You can, however, set parameters around the kitchen being open and closed, which is something that um, my colleague Sarah Remmer advises. So we're not snacky, snacky, snacky up to dinner because that's gonna fill up their little bellies. We want them to have the opportunity to gain an appetite for their meal. 
This is when the kitchen opens. We sit down at the dinner table after the kitchen closes. So if they're hungry in 30 minutes because they didn't eat their meal, the kitchen is closed. There's no new food. Uh, in our house, what we do is like, we invite you, your dinner is still on the table. If you're snacky, I absolutely invite you to go eat your dinner because it's still there waiting for you. And then the only thing we do, because my, <laughs> my daughter is very, very stubborn, uh, we will offer, if she really didn't eat anything, we'll offer her a piece of sprouted green toast before bed. Cause I do not like my child going to bed hungry. Uh, I'm not that old school. So that is typically what we do. Uh, the other thing that I will say is get kids involved. If you can get them involved in the kitchen, if you can get them involved in the grocery shopping, um, it really does help them appreciate food a lot more, particularly if they had a hand in making it. And I've seen my kids suddenly decide to eat things they've never touched in the past because all of a sudden they help chop it. So my heart is out to you. Um, there are amazing dietitians who focus on this work. And so if it's available and accessible to you to seek out the help of a dietitian who can work with you and your child to help create a really loving, safe and positive space around mealtimes. I love that. If you're hungry, eat your dinner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like there's no, like there's no clean, clean plate club in this house. Yep. You're, you're full, fine, cool, but it's going to stay on the table and you can eat it in 30 minutes if you're hungry. Oh, that's so fun. It's so funny how they're never hungry for that, but you know, you give them something, you know, like cake and their appetite just comes right back. Yeah, exactly. I know. Oh, that's so funny. Grownups are like that too. Kathy says DHA is one of the important nutrients in baby formula, but where in nature is DHA found? Amazing. So DHA is found in algae and that's where the fish get it. So a lot of times and a lot of nutrients that we expect are derived from animal foods are actually the bioaccumulation of a nutrient found in nature. B12 is another classic example of this. So we assume because B12 is only naturally found in animal foods, that it's the animals themselves making it, which actually isn't the case. So the, in nature, the bacteria in the ruminant's stomach, in the animal stomach, produce B12. B12 is produced by fermentation and then it bioaccumulates in animal tissues, but that's not even happening now. What is often the, the animals that we choose to eat, they're being supplemented with B12 and then we're eating them and getting the B12. So why wouldn't we just get the B12 from the supplement ourselves and cut out that horrible middle situation? <laughs> That's the middleman. Very good. Hey, yeah. you are going to make something for us today. This is like a special treat. I am. I'm so excited. It is such a simple recipe. These are my chickpea umami burgers. Umami being that like fifth taste that's very savory and delicious. And it could not be easier. So we're really just going to dump a bunch of stuff in the food processor and let the food processor do the work. And then um, I thought for the first time, because I make grilled sandwiches in this all the time, this is my like waffle pancake maker. And I'll move that. And um, we're just going to pop these burgers here because it's nonstick and then we can cook them without oil. So the first thing I'm going to do is just trim this shallot. We're gonna do two little, two little passes on the food processor. The first is just to chop up and mince uh, some of the flavorful ingredients. So we got one medium shallot. Then I've got sun-dried tomatoes. And I wanted to show these to you because in the book it says sun-dried tomatoes in oil because they're really tender. It's really easy to get sun-dried tomatoes, not in oil. So these are just fully dried, like a dried apricot kind of thing. And then what you do is you soak them in super hot water so they soften. And so I've got a third of a cup of those, popping them in there too. And then walnuts, like now we're starting to build the umami. So the sun-dried tomatoes have lots of free glutamates. Walnuts also contribute to the umami. And we're gonna, we're gonna just like grind this up. Once that ground up, so we get all the goodness throughout all the burger, it's really simple. So either three cups of cooked or two cans, no salt added chickpeas, we're gonna pop that in. Then oats. So these are a soft burger. I'm very obsessed with soft burgers. I just don't like things dry. 
So these are a really soft burger with oats. They've got soluble fiber that's going to add as a bit of a binder and give the burgers body. Ground flax, omega-3s, also another really wonderful binder in place of eggs. Now another big umami ingredient, nutritional yeast. I can't live without nutritional yeast. It's a great source of B12. It's just got that rich, cheesy flavor. Spinach. This tiny little cup is two packed cups of spinach that's been wilted. So you just put it in a colander, pour over some boiling water. It takes 10 seconds. And then it ends up with like a tiny little amount of spinach. And then flavorings. So I have onion powder, garlic powder, and cumin. Very much from my grandmother's uh, influence, cumin runs through my veins. I use it a lot in my recipes. It's just got a nice, rich, earthy flavor. A little bit of salt, a little bit of tamari. Again, that fermentation just sort of bumps up that umami note. Some lemon zest to brighten and lift all the flavor. And then to help get it going, this is a quarter cup of water. So the recipe calls for two tablespoons water, two tablespoons of oil, just a quarter cup of water. Sometimes I would say like omit oil and add broth, but this, there's already like a hearty amount of salt in here. So I don't really think you need the broth. I mean, everybody's different, but. All right, so we are going to pulse. And the goal here is to pulse until it looks like 50%. Uh, you know, you don't want it just a paste. You want to have texture, but you want it 50% blended so that there's enough to bind everything together. Might need to scrape a little bit just once. Get it all down. And if you feel that it's too dry, just add more water. This is very much, you know, use your senses. How do things taste to you? How do they look to you? Do they look right? All right. That looks pretty good. So we're going to take that out. And then when you're serving these burgers, whole grain roll uh, or a gluten-free roll, whatever you need. And then they're really delicious with some smashed avocado, maybe a little Dijon, depending how you want to go. And then it's always hard to, I'm going to, just pat this in and then bring it a little bit closer so you can see just a nice little patty that was really easy actually because you didn't have to like cook anything yeah exactly like no and that's you know there used to be all these veggie burgers where you had to cook the brown rice and cook the mushrooms and they're so delicious but it takes like an hour and a half and i wanted a veggie burger you could make on a tuesday if you wanted and then just pop them in and so i've got that set for four minutes literally all that you do like this is very weeknight doable and it's such a hit my kids love them the hubs loves them and yeah i mean who doesn't love a burger exactly we have a nice comment your chana masala from your eat more plants cookbook is one of her all-time favorites says miss sunrise oh thank you so much for that i have to for people who don't know the recipe i credit um one of my best friends her name is pardeep because I really wanted to include a chana masala. And for some reason, mine just wasn't hitting it. It just wasn't hitting the notes I was looking for. And so she's never written down her recipe ever, of course. Uh, so she made it, wrote it down, and then gave me a sample. And what I realized is I had overcomplicated it entirely. I put way too much of like cumin, all these kind of things. And like, I lightened it up and it's just, it's so good. And it's a more dry masala. A lot of people are used to chana masala being really soupy and saucy. This is a more dry masala to be eaten as a side dish. Nice. Uh, Deborah says, have you ever used dried mushroom powder to get an umami flavor? Yes, I actually, I love it. My challenge with it is I don't develop recipes with it because I know it's a bit more of a niche ingredient. And so not everybody will have access to it, but it's, so delicious. And I do like using a lot of not just the mushroom powder, but the dried mushrooms themselves. Um, eat more plants, for example. There is an XOXO sauce, which is my cheeky version of like the Hong Kong famous XO sauce, which is usually made with dried shrimp. I use dried mushrooms to make that happen. Very nice. So, you know, uh, one of the questions that often get asked, well, pretty much every day to everybody on this show, even when they're not plant based, is, what do you eat in a day? Oh my gosh. 
You know, it varies. I, I get, I, I sort of hate routine as much as I know my gut loves routine. I hate routine. So, you know, a great example is the weather is finally getting warm here in Vancouver. It's been unseasonably cold. All I want to do is eat, sm drink smoothies. <laughs> Whereas like two months ago, no way. I was having chickpea egg breakfast sandwiches on sprouted grain bread. But if you, if you have my cookbooks, this is how I eat. I think the only difference is that absolutely I love a potato chip, you know, like absolutely I love to have a couple pieces of candy now and then. So I very much make space for all foods in my life because I feel confident that my body is nourished, that I feel energized based on how I eat most of the time. Nice. Nice. So like, yeah, I bet you have certain favorites. I do. I do. So, um, I love a curry. I absolutely love a curry. And so the curry in Good For Your Gut um, is super, super delicious. It's one of my favorite things. Um, I also love chickpea pasta. It's, I mean, a fiber girl can't get enough. And so I really love chickpea pasta and I do a very simple cashew Alfredo, like just some cashews, some nutritional yeast, some garlic. It's a you know 15 minute meal, add a little bit of veg, that's something we eat often around here too. Um, and then I also love chickpea tuna. It sounds like all I eat is chickpeas. I yeah. promise I have more diversity than that. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's because my kids also like chickpeas a lot. So I love a chickpea tuna sandwich as well for like a really quick go-to with some, um, and then a kale Caesar. Without a doubt, I am that dietitian cliche. I could eat a kale Caesar salad like every day of my life and not be sad. Yeah, that's funny. <gasps> Olivia says, do you recommend whole psyllium husk or powdered? So there is a big difference, which is very frustrating. Um, in some recipes, they can be used interchangeably. Oh, let's go. Oh, the crust on these is going to be impossible for you to see, but it just is beautiful. All right. And Lori wants to know, do the burgers freeze well? Yes. And if you're making them, like if you want to make them on a Sunday night for a Monday, a Monday dinner. Yeah. So there you go. They are a soft burger, um, but they're really, really like decadent and squishy. They're not fall apart. They're just soft. So there we go. A nice little bun. You can put whatever you want on it. Um, so psyllium husk versus psyllium powder. Psyllium powder is going to gel really, really hard. So I often use psyllium husk, particularly if it's a smoothie, it's just going to gel so fast. If you use powder, like you're going to have to use a spoon to eat it, which some people that's fine for them. Um, but there is an amazing recipe in the cookbook that is the seeded loaf. It was um, modeled after the life changing loaf of bread by Sarah Britton, but I wanted to make one that was completely seeds. Psyllium husk is the main binder. You can sub psyllium powder in this recipe specifically, but often if it calls for psyllium husk, you got to use husk. If it calls for powder, you got to use powder. Great. Makes sense. Uh, Gigi says, do you believe in gluten free for all? I do not. So because I have, uh, you know, a digestive health practice, I believe in gluten free for some for sure folks with celiac disease, folks with non-celiac gluten intolerance, and then even folks with IBS, because gluten-containing grains also contain fructans. So it's not necessarily the gluten, it just, oops, it also happens to have gluten. So that often means that gluten is taken out of the diet when you're low FODMAP. I've done deep dives into the literature, and we just don't have evidence to support that gluten does any harm to the normal gut. That being said, not all of us have normal guts and we don't need science to say, well, this food makes me feel bad. If this food makes you feel bad, please don't eat it. Just make sure with a dietitian you can replace the nutrients with something else. So one gluten free for all is 100 percent not supported in the literature. I do caution against avoiding whole grains because whole grains are much higher in fiber than a lot of fruits and vegetables. They also contain two things, which is starch and something called arabinoxylans, which specifically drive the production of short chain fatty acids by the gut microbiome. The cellulose fiber found in vegetables doesn't do this. 
So I don't want folks to eliminate whole grains willy nilly. However, listen to your body. If you're not feeling well, explore with a dietitian. Make sure that you're being really curious about what foods might be causing it. And then also recognize that it often isn't a food, it's a pattern of foods. So if you're eating lots of whole grains, but no fruits or vegetables or no legumes, your body might not be feeling its best because your diet isn't balanced. So it's not the whole grains themselves, it's that you're lacking fruits and vegetables and simply increasing fruits and vegetables while maintaining a moderate amount of whole grains might be all you need. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> All right. Like you say, pattern over plate. Exactly. We need to get a t-shirt. Well, you are just so wonderful. Such a, I mean, your recipes are wonderful. You're so knowledgeable. I'd love to have you on the show again. Actually, I think I am in July now that we think about it. So yeah. people can see you again. If they want to connect with you, Desiree, what's the best way? Is there a certain social media platform that you like to send people to your website? Absolutely. Well, if you're into gut health, I write very in-depth, very nerdy articles on all sorts of gut things from reflex to IBS at DesireeRD.com. And if you want to hang out with me on social, I'm most often on Instagram where I'm at Desiree Nielsen RD. But I have to admit that I have ventured into the TikTok land. I feel like four decades too old for it, <laughs> but I'm there too at Desiree Nielsen Nutrition. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Oh, yeah. Thank you uh, all for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow one hour earlier because my guest is in another country and she needs to start at 10. Her name is Colette Mott and she's going to be making Jack.